Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. We're in the middle of May, May 19th, 2020. Hope folks are doing well. I think the word on the street is we might hit triple digits here today. That's Fahrenheit, not Celsius. Uh, we'd have a severe problem if it was Celsius. Uh, though it feels like it sometimes. It's be kind of early in the year for that, but <laughs> that's, that's the excitement of the weather. All right, let's hop into it. Oh, we've got some new modules and some pretty cool ones this time around. Uh, community contributor Pedrib added three new modules targeting vulnerable versions of IBM's data risk manager software. There's an interesting write-up from Pedrib related to the disclosure of these vulns. You can find links to it in the associated PRs in the framework queue. The first module will obtain an SSH session via default creds and then escalate to root via sudo. Easy peasy. The second module chains together an unauthenticated bypass followed by a path traversal to allow download of non-root files from the target. And the third module achieves, sorry, chains together an authenticated, unauthenticated bypass followed by a command injection as a server user. And finally, abuse of an insecure default password, which was aforementioned in the SSH module to achieve remote command and code execution on a vulnerable target. Pretty cool modules, and I appreciate those contributions. And our own William Vu added a couple new modules targeting vulnerable versions of the Salt Stack Task Configuration Management Framework. The first module takes advantage of unauthenticated access to the prep auth info method in the Salt Stack Salt Masters 0MQ request server to dump the master's root key. And the second module utilizes additional requests to Salt via the runner and SendPod methods to achieve remote code execution on the master node, as well as any minions it manages, which is pretty cool. Uh, Wayne will have a demo of these, so stick around. Will also added a module targeting vulnerable versions of the Veeam 1 agent, which exploits insecure deserialization of .NET objects to achieve unauthenticated remote code execution on the target. With this module, we'll also add a brand new command stager, which uses PowerShell to download and execute a binary. Super cool. Uh, if you'd like to see a demo of this module, check out the recording from our previous meeting. Uh, there was a demo there. And contributor, community contributor Osak added an exploit module targeting Kentico CMS platform versions 12.0.14 and earlier, allowing an attacker to leverage a deserialization vulnerability in the staging service to execute arbitrary commands in the context of the target server process, no authentication required. Pretty nice. All right, and community contributor Stasinopoulos provided a module targeting Trixbox CE, an open source telephony platform. Vulnerable versions can be exploited with this module to gain authenticated remote code execution in the endpoint device map.php page as the asterisk user. Users can then easily elevate their privileges to the root user by utilizing an outdated version of Nmap that comes installed by default on these devices. Good stuff. And we will have a demo of this, so stick around. Our own William Boo added a new module targeting vulnerable versions of NetSweeper web filtering software. This new module allows an attacker to exploit the Unix login.php script within NetSweeper to execute code remotely on the server by injecting Python code into the login process. Pretty slick. We'll have a demo of this one too. Community contributor Mekala added a new auxiliary module called Cloud Lookup. It's a pretty cool module. It attempts multiple techniques to fingerprint IP addresses that can be used for directly connecting to web servers, which are supposed to be protected by cloud-based solutions and can help to identify a common class of misconfiguration vulnerabilities in these scenarios. It's really neat. Contributor B. Coles added a new module targeting vulnerable versions of the Druva InSync client for Windows, which exposes a local service that InSync versions 6.5.2 and prior do not validate user supplied program paths and RPC messages to that service, allowing execution of arbitrary commands to system. Yay. Community contributor Hoodie added a module for escalating privilege via older vulnerable versions of HP operations agent software, taking advantage of how user accessible .so files are loaded. Good stuff. We'll have a demo of this. Our own Brendan Waters uh, added a module uh, targeting, uh, allowing 
privilege escalation via the Windows service tracing, leveraging a junction vulnerability to persuade the RAS dialer to copy a payload to a trusted location that is loaded via the system orchestrator process as NT system. And now you've got system. Easy peasy. We'll have a demo of this one. And contributor Tim Wright uh, added a new privilege escalation module, which exploits a null pointer dereference in vulnerable Windows 7 x86 targets to grant a local attacker system privileges. Uh, we'll have a demo of this one as well. We've got a lot of demos. It's great. And as always, there's a lot of other valuable work going on to talk about outside of the modules. Our own Spencer McIntyre added a new .NET deserialization tool called .underbarnet. Uh, .rb, which allows users to generate serialized payloads like wesoserial.net does for research purposes. Very cool. Our own Brent Cook cleaned up and updated the SAP or SAP ICM pass word list, which is used by the SAP ICM URL scan module to, con to contain more current URLs in use by newer versions of SAP. Uh, and a thanks to community member Kay Loris for providing many of the newer SICF URLs in this update. Community contributor CN Cali team improved interpreters LS command to support expanding environment variables and the path argument on Windows systems. Some nice improvement there. Our own William Vu added a new warning for framework users that changing the SSL option, the value of the SSL option may require a change to the RPort as well, so that you don't get surprised by that. And community contributor B Cole swung through with some C code and updated the Linux full kit PKEXE exec, I should say, helper, ptrace, trace me, local root exploit module to prefer automatic targeting of useful pull kit helpers before falling back to a hard-coded list of helpers. I appreciate that. Uh, and B -call, speaking of bcalls, bcalls also added a new service exists method to the post Windows services mix-in, making it easy to check if a service exists on a Windows target. And our own Alan Foster added enhancements to ensure that developer provided error messages in framework are properly surfaced to users, which should allow users to better debug why errors are occurring. Good stuff. Community contributor Hack Kirks improved the logic for detecting packs on Linux hosts by adding a new set of binaries to check for and by updating an outdated check in the packs installed function. Appreciate that. Uh, community contributor C. Noten updated the Serve, serve host option, or the SRV host option, to add support for network interface names. So you can now either use a local IP address as you had been, or you can use a network interface name like ETH0. So nice usability improvement there. And our own Adam Galway improved the NoDB connected error message to provide additional helpful information in that situation to framework users. Good stuff. And a few bug fixes. We had some bug fixes. Uh, our own Zero Steiner fixed four DNS enumeration issues in the Rex DNS resolver implementation, which had come to light during the review and landing of the new cloud lookup module that we aforementioned a few slides back. Uh, contributor OJ came through with a fix for ensuring packets on pivoted sessions are correctly handled when they are out of order. Uh, it's always good to keep those in order. Uh, contributor, community contributor VoidSec fixed an issue where the Unicode upper and Unicode mixed x86 encoders were not requiring the buffer register option, even though the implementation does require it. Nice catch there. Contributor Tim Wright updated MSF Venom payload generation code to return an error if a stageless Android payload is specified with a template, which is the .x option, which as of right now isn't currently supported, but may be fixed in the future. And our own Alan Foster added a fix to allow MSF JSON RPC to be run from paths other than the framework directory. Good stuff. And as always, we have details on recent framework activity in our weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog posts at blog.rapid7.com. And we do appreciate everybody out there who helps make Metasploit better through their contributions and time spent with the project. Thank you for that. Let's talk some demos. Mr. Waters, you you around? Yes, I am, sir. He is. All right, awesome. This is we're gonna we're gonna demo the HP Operations Agent Privilege Escalation, and I'm gonna start the thing. Uh, All right. This came in from Hoodie. Uh, this is a kind of older uh, piece of software, but what winds up happening is it it 
goes ahead and it grabs some uh, dependencies that are, are vulnerable. And you can see here, uh, the UID is, you know, non-root user. And there are not a whole lot of uh, options for this. Um, it's really straightforward. So all I really need to do here is just set the session. And run. So it's linked to the vulnerable relative path that we are writable to. Uh, and it goes ahead and creates the exploit folder, uh, compiles and runs. We get our session. Do, do, do. Now we just have to wait for a prompt. There we go. Uh, notice here that we are running uh, in a in the temp location, so you, you you'll have to do some cleanup. Uh, but as we can see, I'm now UID of zero. Nice. Cool. Move right along. I believe we've got another one from Brendan on the Windows Service Tracing Privilege Escalation. Sure. Cool. Let's start this puppy up. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and say this is a long walk of an exploit. Uh, and I do want to call out the fact that Spencer did a, sp a fantastic job of finding some bugs in this that I had, I had missed that were giving me trouble. And also Christoph wrote an entire library uh, to help support this exploit. Uh, I'll talk about it in a little bit more. But basically this is a local exploit on Windows 10. Uh, this is a very, this is a pretty new exploit. Uh, as you can see, I can't run git system here. And so we'll go ahead and use the exploit. This uh, has lots of different options. Uh, we're going to have to put up a bunch of full, uh, files on the uh, target system, and then we're going to munge around in the file system itself so that we can get uh, code execution. In this particular case, what this does is it relies on a known DLL injection, or a, sorry, a known DLL hijacking. Uh, and to do that, we use something called the uh, RAS dialer, which is the Remote Assistant Service uh, Toolkit from Windows. Uh, that creates a log file. And if that log file already exists and is a certain size, it gets moved to a different location. Christoph made a library that does a lot of the stuff that's in James, James Forshaw's uh, Google Project Zero uh, syslink toolkit. And basically what winds up happening is we, we do some redirection on the file system to fool RAS dialer and have it write uh, a file to system 32, which we shouldn't be able to do. Then we take advantage of a DLL hijacking error uh, by writing to that system 32 windows core device DLL, which then when we launch uh, the orchestrator, it loads that as system. I hope I've done a decent job of explaining that. <laughs> <laughs> and it can take up to 10 minutes, but we set yes. up just this part a little bit here uh, to, to do that. But I, I think that was a good explanation. Thank you. Uh, that was yeah, part the, uh, of, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say the, the, the time it takes to get your session will change because some, there's a timeout that has to take place that I never quite figured out what the timeout was. Uh, sometimes you'll get it back in no time. Sometimes you'll get it back 10 minutes later. Cool. Caitlin, are you this saying something? Was, this one was part of February's Patch Tuesday. Is that correct? Am I remembering that right? I think so. Yeah. We've, we have been working on this for a very, very long time. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, the other thing I will say is if, if anybody is out there and would, they would like to write exploits that have these file junction tricks in them, because of Christoph, we now have a library that will help us do that, which is absolutely awesome. That is. Great point. Super cool. Thank you, Brendan. 
All right. And we'll move along to Mr. Wilcox. He on the line with the trick box. Yep. RCE. Cool. Uh, we'll start the video up here. Yeah, so this one is a bit of an interesting vulnerability. Originally, we thought it might only affect just a few versions, but as you can see here, I've got Trixbox 1.2.0 and Trixbox 2.8.0.4 both up. Um, we found that the vulnerability doesn't actually affect version 1.0 and version 1.1, but both of those are fairly old. They're like the first two versions that were released. Um, so this vulnerability does affect pretty much every single version that was released minus those two. So as you can see here, I'm just going to load up the vulnerability um, and set some configuration options. Now, the important thing to note is that there are a number of different uh, web URL um, parts that have to be used. So while I'm busy setting up the options here, I'll just explain that basically the original version had one file path, web URL, whatever that you had to go and visit. Um, then there was an intermediary version that had another URL, and then the latest versions have yet another URL. So as part of what we do when we exploit the target, we figure out by browsing to the main page, OK, which version is the target actually running? And then based off of that, we do a little bit of regex behind the scene to go, OK, this is the appropriate URL that we should be using. So as you can see here, I'm targeting Trixbox C 1.2.0. And um, it's just going to take a little while to return the session back. I don't know why, but there is a little bit of delay there. But you can see we identified it's uh, Trixbox C version 1.2.0. So I'm just going to open up a shell, check who I am, which is normally just going to be the asterisk user. And then I'm going to go ahead and load up Nmap. Now, the version of Nmap on all of these machines, as far as we can tell, was an outdated version, uh, which has interactive mode on it. And for some reason, it's got the pseudo permissions that um, allow you to just run it without asking the password. Um, you can then use the at H command, as you can see there, in the interactive mode to immediately escalate to read. So in the following part of this, I'm just going to show that this also works on the latest version, um, which is Trixbox 2.0.8.4. Uh, an important thing to note is that the Trixbox C edition was discontinued in 2012. Um, apparently, they still had a commercial version, but as far as I could tell, I can't seem to find out where they actually um, distribute the commercial version anymore. The community version is still archived on um, SourceForge, which is where I found the downloads for this. So we're just going to go ahead and get the ID again and then attempt the local privilege escalation once more. There's a lot of old software knocking around on source for these days. <laughs> so as you can see, I also got boots on that, which still works on the latest version. Nice. Cool. And uh, we've got a second demo uh, from, from Grant, another privilege escalation. Uh, get this one going here. Yeah, so this was an interesting vulnerability because I actually worked on this before I joined Rapid7. Um, and basically what it is, it's a null point of dereference vulnerability in NT MM user Jago over functionality. Now, this was reported by Google um, as being actively exploited by an APT group. Um, while that exploit in particular also used a sandbox escape, we weren't able to get the sandbox escape to work. Um, hopefully in the future we can add that ability, but at the moment there's still a couple of little errors that make it so it's not as reliable as we would like it to be. Um, in this demo, I'm just going to target the Windows 7 service pack zero. Um, there was a little bit of uh, I guess you would call it like time issue. So I wasn't quite able to demo the Windows 7, 7 Service Pack 1, but the module does work on both Windows 7 Service Pack 1 and Service Pack 0 on x86 only. 
So I'm just going to get a shell on the Windows 7. Um, and I'm going to try escalate privileges using get system. You can see that that doesn't work at the moment. So we're just going to background that session and we're going to load up the exploit. An important thing to note here is that you do have to set the payload option. Um, if you, you can run it without setting the payload, but it will default to some, like, some IP address and ports. So it's not the best idea to run it without setting those options first, because it will probably default to something else that you don't want. So now it's going to go ahead and spawn up a notepad and inject the payload in and then exploit it. You can see that there is some artifacts still. Um, as part of the exploit, it will spawn a new set of menus. Um, so those are still visible while you have the shell. And you can see that we got the system here. I'm just going to verify that quickly by loading Kiwi and then attempting to dump the credentials using Creds W Digest to get the W Digest credentials. And you can see we're running this system and I've got the username and password for the user that I'm currently running as. And, as, and that was just to show that once you close down the session, that uh, visual indication of compromise goes away. Super cool. Are there, uh, as you want to point out too, that I think this also, Windows 2008, some versions of 2008 are also vulnerable, but the, this module currently doesn't target those. Is that, is that an accurate statement? Yeah, so we were going to add uh, Windows to Server 2008 support. Um, in theory, it should also be vulnerable. We just haven't had the time to add it in yet. Sure, sure. Um, are there any questions for Grant on this module? I was actually kind of curious about the the L host um, and L port. Um, that's not something baked into the module, right? That's just kind of just general Metasploit behavior, or is there something in the module specific around that that you had to set it? Um, it's kind of hard to tell because I think normally it, it seems to default to some value. We could take a look at it. Um, okay. Got I it. do know it tends to default to one value in particular, so it's possible it, it could be in the module. Um, I didn't see anything in there that indicated why it would be that. But um, for the payload, because it's a local exploit, it's running a payload. Right. Yeah, I was just curious what the default value for L host would be. I just want to make sure it wasn't like say um, someone's random C two server on the internet or something no, like it was, that. It was a local. It was like another local IP address, but it was like some other one, like one ninety two of one six eight of one that I think was like one forty two. Okay, so it's probably just the, like the first address on your computer. Got it. Uh, it uses auto detection based on whatever it can route to. Um, mm -hmm. There's Rex something source address that should be used there. Thanks, cool. thanks guys. Neat. Thank you for the demos, Grant. Appreciate that, man. Nice. All right, Get some salt stack goodness. Spencer, are you on the line, sir? Yes, I am. Awesome. All right, so we'll start the video up, I think. Oh, crumb. There it goes, all right. Awesome, uh, so this is actually a collection of two modules that uh, both exploit the same vulnerability that were written by the Metasploit team's own William Vu. So the first one that we're gonna go ahead and look at is going to be the auxiliary module. It's the second one we'll take a look at in a second, uses forge check method. And what we're seeing right here is that it's able to connect to the service and leverage the vulnerability to exploit the root key. Now, what we're gonna do in the second one is utilize the exploit module to use that root key to actually be able to go ahead and execute a payload. Now, over on the left-hand side, you can see in the exploit target, we have the ability to execute the payload on either the master or the minion configuration, which is pretty nice that in a real world scenario, you could choose which system you want to actually exploit and get your session on. We're only showing the master right here, but it should work for the minions as well. 
And here we go, we've uh, gone ahead and executed the vulnerability. We saw that the check method was working in prior to that, and we have root code execution through our Python interpreter session that was established. Thank you. Nice usage of yeet. Yeah, I noticed that in the, in the output there. Super cool. The, uh, the ability to, to choose either the master or the minions as targets I think is, is a really cool capability. Thank you for the demo, Spencer. All right. And maybe I think, I think this is the last of our, our demos, uh, the Metasploit demos, uh, the NetSweeper web admin demo. With, uh, William Vu, will you on the line? Yep. Uh, the video is from Brendan. Thank you for that. I'm going to narrate it. All right. <clears throat> Without having seen go. it before. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, hmm. okay. So he's using the module here. Um, it is an HTTP module and uh, targets a Linux environment. Setting the R host here to the target. Uh, the vulnerability is a, a Python code injection, kind of sort of like a command injection, um, but it allows you to inject arbitrary Python into the login process, in fact. So it's all pre-auth. Um, see, seeing a lot more of those lately. <clears throat> Setting the L host for the payload to connect back to. Uh, pretty much fire and forget. Um, we use a separate auth bypass, um, I guess user user check bypass, so we don't have to specify a known user. It'll automatically bypass that and then uh, inject the code and you get root. And NetSweeper is a web content filtering software uh, used in uh, educational institutions, probably not homes so much, uh, governments definitely. Um, yeah. Thank you, Brendan. Cool. Thank you, Will. Any questions for Will on that one? No questions, but we've seen an awful lot of those um, .NET deserialization vulnerabilities pop up recently. Uh, I don't know if it was mentioned on the last demo, but Spencer actually added a .NET deserialization library to support a bunch more of those, which is pretty nice. So thanks, all. So it is, it is a... A wonderful transition for me. So I have an extra demo for you. <laughs> I completely forgot to add it to the deck. Uh, okay. It's for the Kentico yeah. uh, remote code execution. And one of the great thing is it it uses this uh, .NET deserialization uh, library, uh, which uh, like was updated by Spencer uh, 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 a couple of uh, weeks ago. Um, so this library I a new gadget chain, which is Windows Identity, and a new formatter, which is the SOAP formatter. And this module uh, uses it uh, exclusively, and it's great. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, yeah, sounds good. Please. Here we go. Nice. So, yeah, um, OK, cool. So this module is for an, um, an authenticated uh, remote code execution in the Kentico CMS platform. Um, uh, the, the affected version are at 12.0.14 and earlier. So this exploits as a deserialization vulnerability in the staging service to execute arbitrary commands in the context of the target server, which is usually network service or system. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. So the options are the basic options. The only thing you have to make sure you have right is the target URI, which is the sync server page, and uh, uh, your payload. Uh, this, this model has three targets, which is great. The Windows Xdropper, Windows Command, and Windows PowerShell and uh, a check method. So when you run it, you're going to see the common stager um, that actually uh, well, it takes it takes a bit of time to, to do this. But uh, underneath, you, you, you have this wonderful uh, library that is actually um, uh, uh, that generates the payload, um, the .NET uh, digitalization payload. 
So this vulnerability is triggered by sending an HTTP POS request to the sync server interface. Um, the method is process synchronization task data, and the parameter where you inject your payload is staging task data. Um, yep, so here we go. I have a meta bridge session, and uh, here the user I have is a local user because I've run it on um, a VM um, um, and it's not, it's not a service, it's, it's not system or an, uh, uh, any, any other uh, privileged account. But usually it's this kind of account you can uh, find uh, um, for this uh, application. That's it. Thank you. Very cool. Thank you, Christoph. All right. And we'll bring this circle back around, talk about attack KB, the attacker knowledge base, hacker data at community scale, helping shed light on really what matters. Uh, we have a demo today of the new search results filter, which I think a lot of users will find really handy. So if you haven't come across this yet, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll notice it when you're running a search. This is a new way to explore your search results. So I'm just gonna do a, a quick demo, not really dive into all of the, the individual things, but I'll give a quick demonstration here. So let's say um, I'm aware of a recent buffer overflow, but I don't really remember the particular details. I just know that maybe I, it was you know sometime this year. So let's start, we'll search with a buffer overflow. And you know, obviously there's over 8,000 here, so that's a little bit daunting. I need to narrow it down. So that's where we can use these uh, filters over here. Uh, we have CV year, disclosure date, uh, the attack vector, privileges required, and user interaction are uh, CVSS uh, v3 options. And then the remaining three tags, attacker value, and exploitability are based on ratings. So I'm just gonna go to 2020 since I know for a fact I saw some news about that in 2020. Okay, that narrows it down to 101. That's still a lot of results to scroll through. So let's say I'm just interested in exploring, well, let's say I wanna know something that was released this year that it's standing out in my mind because uh, people thought it was um, maybe a very high attacker value, let's say. Let's see what we find here. Uh, Sure enough, uh, we at least have some ratings on this one, and it's from 2020, and that was that was the one I was looking for. I remember now it had something to do with Samsung. Um, so this is just to uh, provide the ability to hunt for uh, your results a little bit better, and you can clear it out there and start over if you want, and dive down based on other things like tags, for example, and see what uh, maybe these are common in enterprise, and we see that we took that very large number down to a uh, more manageable uh, approach, uh, a manageable number of results. Dude, that's, all. that's awesome. Yeah, I think this so is really going to help people find things. Like, you, 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 maybe you know enough, like, oh, I know it was recent, and I know it had these words in it, but then you can really dive in, especially these lower three here, give you a, a focus on people having assessed them, uh, so hopefully these, this, uh, this set of new filters will help our users uh, find topics they're interested in, both from a research side and maybe finding things they want to comment on as well. I love it. No, that's great. No, I'll take the opportunity to, well, I'll just point out real quick that, that this is, if you look at the top of Matthew's screen, you can see this is attackerkb.com. So this is available in production. Yep, it's live. It's been live for yeah. a while. There you go. Any, yeah, as in Matthew said, any, any questions on this or comments? Can I say right. awesome again? Is that okay? Totally. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> yeah. We're going to allow this. Excellent. Cool. Thank you for the demo, Matthew. Appreciate that. Absolutely. Excellent.